Um, for this, I created um, just a little bit about our glass factory, because you've all kind of been in the artifacts and the collections enough times now, um, but you may not know the history of. So it is a 105 year history. I'm gonna jump decade to decade. I'm gonna bounce around. If there's <coughs> any questions at all, just shout them out. It's all good. I'm better in a casual kind of environment than a speech one. So yeah, 105 years of glass. So to talk about the glass factory, first we have to talk about the vision that one man had. He is pictured here and his name was Captain William Taylor. He was born on November 2nd of 1818. He was born in Bristol, England, which at the time was known for being one of the leading manufacturers of glass in the world. He came to Canada with his family at the age of three and settled in Sombra until 1851 when they moved to Wallaceburg as a family. When he had arrived in Wallaceburg as a young man, it was densely covered in forest. The main and really only industrial enterprise in the area was uh, logging, the shipping of logs, and uh, stave mills. There was one stave mill in town. William Taylor's father played a major role in the logging and shipping industry in order to support his family. He also ventured into shipbuilding when opportunities became available to him. As per the time period, young William Taylor had not had much access to education um, beyond being trained to read, write, and possibly do basic math. He was most likely to follow in his father's footsteps as a ship's captain and lumberer, as most young boys were trained by their fathers to pick up and do the same jobs as them when they were of a certain age. This training from the family would replace what we see as a traditional education today. And, oh, that's Captain Taylor. You can see him a little better now in his younger years. So despite not having very much formal education, Captain Taylor was known amongst his peers for being a bit of a mathematical genius. He earned himself a certificate as a steam engineer and later also obtained his first class captain's certificate. Over his years of sailing, he captained many ships, including the Tug Messenger, the Steam Barge Uno, and the TJ Collop, which is pictured there, uh, full of logs, as his family was part of the logging industry. Um, sorry. <coughs> so yeah, the collop was used to harvest trees along Lake St. Clair, and William enjoyed a long and successful career as Captain Taylor, and that's him as an older man from the corner. It was on all his journeys up and down the waterways in the area that made Captain Taylor really notice there is an abundance of sandy deposits along the river. And he began to think that perhaps a glass factory would do well in Wallaceburg, just like the ones he saw growing up in England. Aboard one of Captain Taylor's ships, the idea for the Citadel <coughs> Glass Factory was born. The logging industry started to decline with the trees, and they needed new opportunities, especially industrial ones, in Wallaceburg to maintain the economy as well as keep people employed and coming to populate the young village. He decided then to at least try and make his dream a reality, but he knew he wasn't going to be able to do it alone. So Captain Taylor shared his idea with two other prominent businessmen in town at the time. They were David Alexander Gordon and James Winard Steinhoff. Steinhoff was Gordon's uncle, and the two had already shown their entrepreneurial skills through the Steinhoff and Gordon stave mill, which is pictured. <coughs> The stave mill had been operating as Wallaceburg's first industry for a few years already. It was situated on the south side of the Sydenham River, near the end of what is now Murray Street. Steinhoff was also a ship's captain at the time, and he had a great interest in the growth of his town. He was born in 1834 and had been living in Wallaceburg since 1850, coming to town as a young boy around the same time as Captain Taylor. His father, however, was a farmer, and James was seeking a different future. He picked up odd jobs in his youth, cooking for lumber gangs and transporting timber via ox and cart. 
As mentioned, the stave mill was a great achievement of his, of his, and he got into shipbuilding as well to further support his own business and shipping ventures. D.A. Gordon, Steinhoff's nephew, was born in Wallaceburg in 1858. Being a slightly younger man in the business world, partnering with his uncle in the stave mill was his first major industrial venture. He was known to be a very ambitious man, however, and this would not be his only industry in Wallaceburg, which we will come back to D.A. Gordon a bit later. So, Captains Taylor and Steinhoff and D.A. Gordon got together and all agreed with the declining lumber industry, Wallaceburg needed a replacement industry. They needed to keep the people employed, keep them coming to Wallaceburg, and honestly keep the financial interests of these three men safe if they were mostly employed in shipping. This poster was added to the Wallaceburg Herald on March 9th, 1891. It is asking the townspeople for a full attendance in Town Hall on March 11th to discuss the possible establishment of a glass factory in town. And that, I don't know if it says it, that meeting happened at 505 King Street. Does that address stick out to anybody? <laughs> Did you put it in your it's GPS this morning? <laughs> that is, it's not the building anymore, but this is the site of Wallaceburg's first town hall, um, which was also an opera house, probably is why it looks a bit like a church. <laughs> but um, it was torn down in 25 and replaced with uh, the building we're in right now. So this building is 99 years old. And it'll be 100 next year, next summer. So the glass factory already had three major investors and more came out of this town meeting. Everyone was pretty excited at the idea of a new industry, especially one as interesting as glass. Everything was going quickly and smoothly for the new glass factory. But, and there's a big but. Those big piles of sand that inspired Captain Taylor to start a glass factory. After the town meeting, after the investment of the people and the beginning of the building of the factory, Captain Taylor took some of that sand to England to have it tested for its glass making ability. And they found out that it was completely unsuitable. Um, maybe it could only be used for rough pottery, but that is all. Sydenham uh, sand was not going to be used for glass making. So the solution ended up looking a little bit like this, where sand was brought in by large quantities by boat or other suppliers. This particular photo is actually shipping out of Wallaceburg from, we had a sand and gravel co uh, here, um, but the dream, the idea is the same and the dream was saved again. So now they finally had the idea, the placement, the materials, and the building. So these two stock certificates um, from the Sydenham, we have quite a few in the collection. Um, these ones are kind of interesting. So the top one is for James Steinhoff himself, Captain Steinhoff, Esquire. And then the bottom one is quite hard to read, but it says the Corporation of the Village of Wallaceburg, which I always say translates to the people of Wallaceburg. Uh, so they really, the town supported. So the first day of production came in 1894 and it was an especially exciting one. The contractor that had been hired to complete the furnaces had been dragging his feet and had bad reviews from other new glass factories in Ontario. There is evidence in the files of trouble in Wallaceburg as well, with bad business practices and questionable craftsmanship. But finally, in April 19, 1894, the furnaces were completed and Captain Steinhoff himself lit the first fires to begin warming the new massive furnaces. However, the first day that they began to run batch through these furnaces to create glass, the pressure became too much and massive cracks formed in the furnaces. The result was molten glass pouring like lava across the brand new wooden factory floor. 
This caused so much damage that the factory had to close for close to another year, oh. not starting production again until 1895. This rock you see pictured is actually a piece of glass that was removed from the floor of the glass factory on that day, or probably not, probably the next couple days once it cooled. Um, but from that cleanup is what that piece of color is from. The cleanup was likely immense and mostly done by hand with shovels. And the photos on the right are of one of the two earliest fires of the glass. I just didn't want to cheat. It could be the first day fire, it could be one just a couple of years later, but that is um, 1890s at the glass house, or early 1900s. So by 1895, there weren't any more problems with the furnaces per se, um, and artisans were blowing the first pieces to come out of the factory. Finally, it was looking like the business that had been um, dreamt up four years earlier uh, might be able to produce and be profitable. But before I move on to what happened more at the glass factory, I wanted to finish off the, the stories of our three investors, because they did do more after that. So, despite all of his prior shipping history and tales of Captain Taylor being an entrepreneurial genius, uh, apparently he did not end up a wealthy man at the end of his life. His wife passed away 15 years before he did, and it is said that his passion and drive for business ventures went with her. He lived with his son in his late years and was known to keep up with the latest scientific inventions for fun, but was no longer looking for business ventures, new or old. Taylor, according to early plant records, also never actually held stock in the company he helped build, but remains known as one of the founders of Wallace Briggs Glass Industry. After 84 years of existence, he passed away in 1902, apparently a financially burdened man. Captain Steinhoff was made the first mayor of the town of Wallace Berg in 1896. In 1901, he was instrumental in the building of Wallaceburg Sugar Factory. During the First World War, he was pushing for a hospital in Wallaceburg to house those suffering from the Spanish flu, and he personally purchased the Cenotaph for the town after World War I. The Cenotaph is known as Steinhoff's last gift to Wallaceburg, as he died three days after its unveiling in 1921. And D.A. Gordon continued into more business with his uncle Steinhoff as well. In 1901, he was the first president of the sugar factory. In 1905, he was instrumental in the building and operation of the Wallaceburg Brass Factory. And he also helped to develop the Chatham, Wallaceburg, and Lake Erie Railway Company in 1904. Again, like his uncle, he branched into politics and was mayor of Wallaceburg from 1898 to 1900. And he was the first from Wallaceburg to ever participate in federal politics. He was elected as East Kent's Member of Parliament in 1911. He passed away in 1919, but the Gordon family remained prominent in the development of early Wallaceburg. In our staircase up to this hall, you might have noticed a large portrait of Jean Gordon, the uh, Broadway star. DA was her father. And actually, he had a son as well, Arthur St. Clair Gordon, who started the cut glass factory. That's not in the presentation. But, yes. These are some faces from the earliest days of the Sydenham glass factory. Um, the two guys, two smaller pictures over here. Um, that's mostly the packing shipping department. And I believe that these guys on the right maybe not the women, um, are blowers and boys. And if you look super close, some of the guys, especially in the back, are holding things that they very likely made. Just give me one second. This guy is holding a glass hatchet. And he has a big bottle. I'm not sure what he's holding, but... Kind of interesting. Those are your glass blowers. Late eighteen hundreds. Any questions? No. Shout them out if you have them. So, back 
back to the development of the factory. <coughs> the greenhouse was the first glass production building to go up as it was included in the original plans for the company. It was named for the color of glass produced inside, which would either be green like this or more often this, sorry, up top, or more often a teal tinged color um, like that guy at the bottom, which was sometimes as clear as it could get. This photo on the left is one of the first photos of the original greenhouse taken approximately 1895. The structure only stood about a decade and was leveled by fire in 1901, but was promptly rebuilt. The photo on the right is the greenhouse in 1902. In the photo on the left, you can just barely see a rail car out of frame. It's very small, but there's a C and O and then line. I imagine it said rail line or whichever. Um, and then this one taken from a different angle, you can see the proximity to the river. So that was both done for shipping and receiving. They had to have their sand in, um, material, or finished products back out. Everything was done by manpower and that horse from the last slide. So um, everything was pretty close by. <clears throat> the next building to go up at the factory was the Flint House. Again, this was named for the color of glass that was produced inside. And this building went up in 1898, just three years after the factory's opening. It also was leveled by fire shortly after that and rebuilt in 1903. Flint glass is essentially clear glass. Uh, flint refers to lead, usually, or sometimes magnesium, um, used to make the glass look clear. And flint can be identified, I'm sure you guys all know this, but if you flick it and it pings kind of like crystal, um, then it's likely flint. And if um, manganese is present in it, it will glow ever so slightly green under um, a certain wavelength of UV light. These bottles pictured were all made at the flint house, and some were actually dug up from the ground where the, where the building once stood. Um, in 1908, this production building was added to the factory to house glass making machines that had just begun become available to the world. It was called the New House and mainly produced amber glass bottles. Bottle machines allowed for much faster production, as can be seen by the amount of bottles um, in this interior shot of the new house. The new house actually remained on the property until the factory's closure in 1999, and it was referred to as the new house until 1999. Um, but in the 70s, at some point, it was switched to just a storage building. Um, but actually, just yesterday, we had a woman in, and she had worked at the glass um, for a summer or two, and um, she was remarking how weird it was that the oldest building on site was called the New House, because <laughs> the um, Greenhouse and Flint House didn't survive till the end. But, tis the New House. And actually, if you have Amber Cullet, it probably came out of the New House. So there's the three production buildings side by side. Got the greenhouse, the new house in the middle, and the flint house on the right. You can see, again, proximity to the railroad, proximity to each other, and the river is just on the other side of the greenhouse. Everything was kind of manpower, so as close as you could would be great. That's probably also why the fires spread so easily. So, in 1909, just as the new house was really beginning to crank out production, a major fire destroyer destroyed half of the build or the property. So I'll, I'll just read this newspaper clipping for you guys. Plant at Wallaceburg destroyed with loss of $125,000. April 13th, the Wallaceburg glass factory was wiped out this morning by a fire 
which started from a defective fuse in the electric wiring in the room where the glass is tempered. It is estimated that the loss is $125,000, which is covered by insurance. The main building and 10 other buildings were burned to the ground, none of the contents being saved. Only two of the buildings of the plant are now standing. The Chatham Fire Department went to the scene at eight o'clock, but were unable to render any assistance as their engine would not work. It is estimated that 350 men will be thrown out of work. D.A. Gordon, MP, president of the glass company, will arrive home from Ottawa tomorrow. It is likely that the company will <coughs> rebuild at once. And that is what they did. They rebuilt at once. Um, I kind of got cut off there, but my little graph in the corner, 125,000 adjusted for inflation in 2024 is $4.2 million of damage. So they did promptly rebuild. And the fire of 1909 was the last major fire to harm the company and its growth to that extent. <coughs> Even with its seemingly regular fires, the company was very successful, and in 1913, there was a merger between the Diamond <coughs> Glass Company and the Sydenham Glass Company, which resulted in the factory's first name change. They went from Sydenham Glass Co. to Dominion Glass Co. and adopted the Diamond D logo that we all in town recognize so well today. We use this diagram at the museum to identify glassware from this time period. There's a saying that goes, Hamilton is on the hill and Wallaceburg is always right. Meaning uh, Hamilton's dot, they put dots on each corner of the D for each factory. Hamilton's always on top, Wallaceburg's always right. Those are the two major ones we have in the collections. That's what I can easily remember. Um, from there, the other two factories, one was in Red Cla Redcliffe, Alberta, which is represented by a dot underneath the D and one was in Montreal, which is represented by um, a dot on the left of the D. So at the time of the first production buildings, they each made one color because it was easiest to keep the ingredients needed for each color inside or close to each house. During the 1920s, under the new management of the Diamond Glass Company, the factory modernized and moved more towards automation. With this, they built their first batch tower, which is pictured on the right. It was made out of wood, but it would send the required batch in the required color to whichever production building was needed. This was done by conveyor, which can be seen in the photo. In the 1960s, the wooden batch tower was replaced with the concrete structure that stood in Wallaceburg until 1999. The replacement was simply stronger, larger, and had the new modern equipment needed to support Wallaceburg's now booming glass industry. The photo on the right features our Glass Retirees Club in 1999 in front of the glass factory. This is probably one of the last pictures ever taken of it standing. But what was life like for the people who were making this industry so successful? We have a large collection of stories written about Wallaceburg's earliest glass blowers, and some came to us naturally, some we've collected, but there's a specific collection from 1940 that Roy Matheny um, went and interviewed the earliest glass blowers that he could that were still in Wallaceburg. And I wish I could stand here and read them all to you because they were absolutely incredible. Um, but I do want to share Moise, Moise Luan's um, story. And this was written, I'm leaving it as it was in 1940. Um, so here's what Matheny wrote about Moise. From the province of Quebec and the city of Montreal, he commenced life on May 5th, 1879. On April 2nd, 1890, not quite 11 years old, he reported for duty as a carrying in boy. We always started at that job, says Mose, because it was the easiest. There wasn't a job he didn't do during the next nine years, even tended the annealing ovens. 
reports that he had to know all about the factory before going on as an apprentice. In 1899, he began learning the bottle blowing trade. He was married at the age of 22 and now boasts a family of 16 children. <laughs> Nine girls and seven boys. There is also one set of twins. Donat, one of the twins, is with the first Kents in Terrace, BC. After coming out of his apprenticeship, he worked year in and year out on sample oils and <coughs> From 1910 until 1920, the three brothers, Mose, Arthur, and Aim, worked as blowers on the same shop, and for some time, two of Arthur's boys shut molds and snapped up. It was a real family affair. He came to Wallaceburg for the first time in 1907, stayed for one year, and returned to Montreal. Then in 1917, he came back and has been here ever since. The last time he blew bottles was in August 1936. He hasn't had a pipe in his hand since that time. On April 2nd, 1943, he will start his 54th year in the glass industry. Says he will challenge any old timer to a foot race and also the young ones. His outstanding feat is chewing tobacco and gum at the same time. <laughs> That's Moses' story, in Moses' words. <laughs> Uh, but on the right, so uh, that's him in his shop. I think he worked on molds more towards the end, or in the 40s at least. And um, on the right, that's him with a couple of Dominion Glass executives as well. So from the company change, name change from Sydenham Glass Company to Dominion Glass Company and the construction of the wooden batch tower, the next major change to factory life did not come until the 1940s. The outbreak of World War II changed production. All focus in the factory switched to war production, including vehicle lights, submarine parts, and more. Also during this time, the Wallaceburg Domin Dominion location became one of the only factories in Canada with the rights to utilize a Hartford IS machine, which was a bottle making machine. These items pictured here are part of the factory's home front campaign. I believe proceeds from the sales of all these glasses were sent to the war effort. And you can see some of them feature a bit of war propaganda as well. Um, the one with Churchill on it says a toast to Churchill the man. And then the little jar there, uh, that was for a Wallaceburg victory campaign. So it was a campaign outside of the glass that you know, they wanted to save their pennies in a jar for the war. Well, the glass provided the jars, so they were right <coughs> it. And ashtrays were a big one because they were also sending cigarettes overseas. But the war brought, I mean, obviously just some discontent, but more than enough in the home front as well. On Monday, February 1st, 1943, Workers from the Dominion Glass Company in Wallaceburg went on strike. The employees picketed the streets outside the factory for a number of reasons. The right to choose the union that represented them, better working conditions, vacation and health benefits, wages, and for recognition as an essential war industry. The men and women felt that the car lights made for army vehicles, submarine battery cases, ashtrays, and beer bottles were all examples of essential items made at Dominion Glass. At the end of February, frustrations between police and strikers escalated. Wallaceburg law enforcement had trouble keeping order and called in 150 OPP officers for help. On several occasions, the the town's chief of police, Charles Worm, ordered his men to use tear, tear gas and clubs on the crowds to disperse them. Thomas Sherwood, chairman of the local uh, 251 Glass Workers Union, remarked on the violence used by police. The only difference between conditions at Wallaceburg during the strikes and those under Tsarist Russia was the fact that the Russians called out the Cossacks to settle difficulties and we got the provincial police. <laughs> Sherwood's comments, though extreme, highlight how brutal the violence was on occasion during labor disagreements. 
Other Canadian historians demonstrated that the Wallsburg strike helped initiate the conversation um, to change collective bargaining laws in Ontario. It was kind of a historic strike. But on March 29th, 1943, the Glass Town strike, as it had become dubbed, ended. This was after 59 days of picketing, $75,000 in lost wages, and a cost of $7,500 to the provincial government for additional police services rendered. After the strike and the end of the war, factory life widely returned to normal for a while. Uh, there was focuses on growth, there was a lot of machines being introduced, um, the day of the glass blower kind of went away. There is a very brief factory name change that came again in 1976. The switch was to Dom Glass, spelled like this, it kind of reminds me of glass facts. Um, <coughs> but they call it the bottle era. We do not have a lot in the collection from this era of glass, but we do have is mostly bottles. Um, and then a couple tumblers, though I don't think the focus at the time. Uh, Bill here retired during the Don Glass era, and that is his um, retirement tumbler that went out to everyone. And their logo was a D for Don Glass, probably half of Dominion Glass. And then I think it's meant to look like a bottle is kind of pressed into the, the center of the D there. Again, the switch to the name Dom Glass was very brief, only two years. And after that, the company was purchased by Libby Glass, which was based out of Toledo, Ohio. The factory changed names again to Libby St. Clair, and the logo changed to something which looks to me more like a, oops, Four leaf clover. This era produced a lot of tableware, especially tumblers and gift sets. This uh, You Need Glasses tumbler is a promotional piece that went out during the Libby era, and the back of it lists all the different types of tumblers they could make for you. So the Batch Tower was painted during this time as well. And this image of the Libby St. Clair Batch Tower is still very iconic to a lot of locals today. Um, I hear it all the time. It was lit up for every holiday and um, you could see it from all over town. Everyone knew where they were based on where the Batch Tower was. Just one year before the factory's 100 year anniversary, Wallaceburg's glass factory became the only Libby location left in Canada. Another name change was had, taking out the St. Clair and adding Canada. By now in Wallaceburg, it was already regularly referred to as Libby or as the glass. Um, so it didn't seem like a huge change to the locals or the workers um, at the time. Again, that was just uh, one year before their 100th anniversary. And in 1994, there was a town-wide celebration of the glass. There was a massive cake cut, all of the workers and all of their families were there, um, and probably locals who didn't have families working there. The Kilty Band marched and played um, a performance for everybody. They released balloons over the town and a huge crowd chanted, a hundred more years, a hundred more years. But that small change from Libby St. Clair to Libby Canada was a lot bigger than was initially felt. Uh, just five years after its 100th anniversary, the, uh, the glass factory was closed for good forever. And these are some pictures from those last few days. So that is in one of the lunch rooms or break rooms. Everyone signed goodbye, so long, good luck. It's been a slice. And that is town historian Alan Mann looking into the furnace for the last time before it got removed. And this is just moments after that class retirees 
photo, everyone in front of the batch tower, that was the day that they detonated it and brought it to the ground. This happened because Libby was transferring operations to Mexico and keeping head operations in Ohio. Wallaceburg lost about 500 jobs and of those 200 people signed up to get high school diplomas that year. And the, uh, the newspapers from that week said that um, the local employment, unemployment offices, Wallaceburg and Chatham, were preparing for a nightmare <laughs> the next week. And that is kind of our 105 years of glass. Um, just thought I'd add a little picture of as much as the factories you can see at once. That's our Glass House Retirees Club. They, um, they're outside of the museum, but I think it's still a hydro hall at the time. No, still That's a museum. That museum. That's a museum? Okay. Yeah. It's a museum with windows. We don't have those anymore. Yep. <laughs> and then those are your early um, staff of the same family. Yeah.